So, we come to the part 2 of uh, the lesson on heat sources, we will continue from where we have left. So, we have uh, the situations uh, we have discussed uh, uh, where we will be combining uh, multiple heat sources. So, why would we need to combine heat sources or sinks is as follows. So, apart from the welding torch or the beam, uh, there are other heat, uh, heat sources as well as heat sinks that will be present in the welding. And we have uh, heat uh, sources apart from the welding torch for preheating conditions for example, or hybrid welding conditions. And then we may have heat sinks that could be either trailing uh, because we want to remove the heat to control the distortion for example. So, in situations like this we have uh, the possibility of multiple heat sources and sinks that have to be uh, combined. And then we also need to uh, remember that uh, heat source and heat sink mathematically is just one and the same except for the sign. And the heat removal processes will be separately taken. So, we are only going to look at the heat sources and sinks together uh, in the rest of the lesson. So, here I have shown you two heat sources that are being joined and the one with the taller uh, uh, appearance is the welding uh, heat source and the one ahead of it is the preheating uh, heat source. So, you may have uh, two torches that are doing this job and you could combine uh, two Gaussian functions uh, to achieve this. Uh, essentially, we have taken uh, two Gaussian functions with the different uh, intensities and then uh, shifted the origin of uh, one of the Gaussian functions and then added the values and then plotted this. So, it is it is possible for us to now uh, make such a complicated appearance of heat source in just one combination of a function. And uh, as you can see from this uh, combination that if the leading heat source is a little too close to the torch, uh, then it may appear as only a shoulder uh, for the first heat source, which means that it may uh, simulate an asymmetric uh, heat source. And if it is far away, then in between you will have a situation when there is no heat. In other words, the heating that is given by the leading heat source is not lost by the time the welding comes. So, you could actually play with the positioning of the two so heat sources in the computer using a MATLAB script for example, and adjust the spacing in such a way that the amount of heat uh, in the trough between the two peaks is adequate to maintain the preheat that you want to have in the welding setup. So, it is very important to be able to analyze the heat sources in this manner before we actually try to implement and fabricate a very complicated nozzle for our welding setup. And one can combine a heat source and a heat sink also the same way except for the sign of the uh, second Gaussian that we are going to add. Uh, here in this situation we are taking it as a negative. So, as a result you can see that uh, here we have plotted a heat source which is for the torch and then a heat sink which is behind the torch and the heat uh, uh, is the heat source is moving in the y direction uh, as I have plotted here. So, you can see that uh, the heat uh, source and sink together uh, would uh, look like uh, what is shown in the schematic and then in the region between the two you will have a cancellation of some of the heat by the welding torch because of the sink. So, if you have the heat sink too close you may lose the heat uh, behind the torch and again you may have a significantly asymmetric uh, heat source that is coming up. And if it is too far away then uh, the heat sink may not be effective because it is trying to remove heat from uh, the material when most of the heat is anyway already gone. So, again uh, even in this situation where we have a heat source and heat sink uh, identifying the distance between the two uh, to have appropriate heat transfer uh, is important. And uh, further discussion of uh, how different heat sources have been modeled by different researchers across the world will be uh, meaningful when we understand that welding is generally done in two very different modes. The two modes are called as conduction mode and keyhole mode. By conduction mode what we mean is that the weld pool happens to be shallow and wide and then uh, it is normally achieved when we have uh, weld heat sources which are of low intensity uh, of the heat source. And these are processes which are like GTAW and lower than that. And uh, in situations like plasma welding, laser welding and electron beam welding, we have a mode of welding that is possible which is called as a keyhole mode. And keyhole mode is achieved when the heat source intensity is very high and uh, this mode is very attractive because you could join a very thick plates using a single pass uh, because of the deep penetration of the heat source uh, through the thickness of the 
uh, weldment and uh, you normally see uh, narrow and deep pools, but uh, at the very top of the weld pool, uh, the weld pool has a shape that is very close to the conduction mode. So, you could actually imagine the keyhole mode as conduction mode plus a vertical column uh, which is forming the keyhole. And it is not as if these two modes can be chosen uh, a priori, these are basically uh, coming because of the heat transfer phenomena that is taking place during the welding and the heat intensity variation achieves the transfer between one mode to the other. And we will later discuss how we can uh, pick a heat intensity value such that the keyhole mode is stable and uh, conduction mode uh, is uh, preferred when you have a lower heat intensity and what would be that value also we can uh, design and we will look at the discussion uh, in a later section. So, the kind of heat sources that will be applicable for welds which are showing a keyhole mode uh, are going to be very different from the Gaussian. The reason being that the Gaussian heat source though it does show a high heat intensity at the center of the weld, uh, it is not adequate to be able to capture the fact that uh, in a keyhole. Uh, the vapor column actually absorbs heat uh, right through the thickness and the Gaussian is only a surface heat flux. So, very often a volumetric heat source is used to capture the weld pool uh, shape evolution using a keyhole mode welding. And uh, we are going to look at uh, the uh, heat sources that uh, cover this kind of a, a method and I am listing uh, one after them uh, here. So, a cylindrical heat source for example, is a very simple uh, extension to the Gaussian heat source you could see that the first part of the function in the exponential is looking exactly like a Gaussian and there is a multiplicative factor which depends upon the thickness. So, z is the height from the uh, sample surface and h is the thickness of the entire vapor column. So, as you go from uh, the top surface to the bottom, you can see that the thickness is uh, being uh, used to uh, tell you that there is a heat source that is available even in the thickness direction. So, you can see that the heat source is no longer x y function, but it is x y z function. So, how does that uh, cylindrical heat source look like? I am showing them at uh, three different heights and you can see that at the very top surface it is a bit wider and at the bottom it is a bit narrower. Okay? And uh, as you go down it is actually uh, uh, having the same peak value roughly, but the width is decreased and the plot uh, here also shows you. Uh, from uh, the top surface to the bottom surface uh, how the width of the heat source is changing. So, cylindrical heat source can reproduce the keyhole shape uh, mode of uh, fusion zone evolution and uh, people have used it to simplify the heat source distribution. However, uh, this may not uh, reproduce the entire keyhole mode in all the welding processes and that is why people have gone for other heat source models as well. So, we will look some of them now. A 3D conic volume heat source has been shown to be uh, quite uh, good in reproducing the shapes and here I am showing you that the conic heat source is essentially the Gaussian uh, uh, heat function uh, multiplied by a factor which is uh, not just a simple ratio, but a square uh, function. So, you can see that uh, when you go from the top to the bottom of the uh, uh, keyhole, you can see that the intensity variation is much, much larger than in cylindrical heat source. So, a conical heat source that way lowers the amount of heat distribution variation at the bottom of the, uh, the sample uh, compared to at the top. So, the conical shape is shown here uh, shows you how the volumetric uh, heat distribution is done. At the top it is wider and at the bottom it is narrower. So, such a function actually can be used to capture how the uh, keyhole mode welding will be done uh, to show you the heat transfer uh, difference between the top and the bottom due to the heat source. A Gaussian rod also can be used. In other words, basically a Gaussian function multiplied by a, a z function. So, such a function also can be used. It is a very, very simple uh, kind of a function where the heat source is centered at 0 and then multiply a function u of z and then that value can be chosen from going from 1 to 0 uh, and uh, it is just a rod which means that it is a perfect cylinder and that also can be used to model the heat source which is volumetric in nature. One can also uh, use the fact that for laser welding particularly the absorption of the laser by the material depends upon the thickness through which the laser is supposed to pass through. And as you know for solids and uh, liquids the uh, density of the material being very high, the absorptivity is also very high and uh, the attenuation distance is very, very small. 
So, in, in, in uh, very often it is in just microns, whereas in the vapor column the absorptivity is not that small and because of the lower density of the material and very often you have Beer Lambert's law that is applicable. So, that we can see how the uh, laser light is absorbed as it goes through the vapor column and that can be then merged along with the Gaussian heat source to combine to get what is called as an internal volumetric heat source for deep penetration welding in a laser keyhole mode welding. And this is shown here as an illustration you can see the Gaussian component and the Beer Lambert's law e raise power of minus beta z and beta is the absorption coefficient uh, which is uh, uh, shown here which is also coming out and this kind of a function can be used to capture the uh, keyhole mode welding in uh, lasers. And the reference at the bottom shows you uh, one implementation in the recent open literature uh, that uses this particular kind of a heat source. Uh, one can also use what is called as a rotary Gaussian heat source uh, that is basically a, uh, a heat source that looks quite similar to a conical heat source. However, uh, it is not uh, a function that is uh, uh, going as 1 plus z by h or uh, uh, h square by h square minus z square, but it is actually 1 by log of z by h and which basically changes the way the heat uh, absorption is changing from the top to the bottom of the uh, keyhole uh, and that function uh, is shown here for illustration. You can see that the rest of it actually is uh, looking like Gaussian and there is a fitting par parameter f s which shows you to control uh, how fast or how slow. Uh, this attenuation of uh, the energy uh, change from the bottom to the top can take place. So, by using uh, uh, more parameters in the heat source, you could actually uh, fit the heat source to the reality as close as possible. And the most popular among the heat sources that uh, are used by the commercial welding softwares uh, is the so called double ellipsoidal heat source. So, essentially we have got two ellipsoids and uh, half of uh, both will be taken uh, together and then we have a double ellipsoid heat source. And uh, this has been uh, uh, one of the very highly cited uh, publications in the welding literature almost more than 950 times by Goldack et al. And the heat source also goes after his name, uh, it is also called as Goldack double ellipsoidal heat source. So, how does it look like? It looks like this, the, you have a, a ellipsoidal uh, function uh, that uh, is indicated by these three uh, squares that are added and then the minus sign to show you that the heat source is going to be attenuated as you go away from the center and uh, then you have these coefficients that will tell you which are different from each other showing you that it will be ellipsoidal in nature. So, you have got basically four uh, coefficients a f, a r, b and c that will tell you how to change the shape of this heat source depending upon the actual welding process that you are doing. And you would normally choose A R and F A F that is the uh, shape of the heat uh, source in the front and the rear directions to be different uh, because of the what is called as a weld pool trailing effect. As the weld source is moving then the weld pool tends to get trailed and which means that it is going to ref, uh, look like a teardrop shape ok. On the uh, location behind the center of the weld pool the distance is far away uh, to the fusion line compared to ahead of the center of the uh, fusion zone. And uh, in the materials that have high thermal conductivity such as aluminum, the trailing effect is not so significant. So, which means that A f and A r can be chosen to be different from each other when the material has low thermal conductivity and uh, similar to each other when the material has high thermal conductivity. And B and C can be chosen by looking at uh, how the um, actual welding process is done. And the Q r and Q f are the heat sources in the forward and uh, uh, rear directions and whether they are 50 50 or they are going to have a, a proportion that will be different in the front and rear half is also a choice that is to be done uh, by taking feedback from uh, the simulations to see whether this kind of a heat source is replicating the heat transfer profile uh, correctly or not. The Q value which is in front of the exponential shows you the nominal heat uh, input that is given that is V i voltage and current and then eta which is the efficiency of the heat transfer. And uh, the three distances are uh, not given as x, y, z, but in terms of y we have got another variable here which uh, is uh, modified with the time and v is the velocity and t is the time which shows you that this heat source is written in a way that it is moving with time. And there is a uh, value here tau which can tell you uh, whether there is a lag factor that can be used uh, 
uh, while using this kind of a heat source. Okay, so, as you can see that there are large number of parameters that are uh, available in a double ellipsoidal heat source which means that perhaps it can fit most of the welding uh, heat sources uh, with the exception of the keyhole mold welding and then it can actually match the weld pool shape quite accurately. However, how do we go about varying these four coefficients to fit the uh, heat source is a different exercise which we will discuss at a later point of time. There is also what is called as a nail head heat source. This is actually inspired by the shape of the keyhole itself. The top of the keyhole is going to be looking like a conduction mode and there the Gaussian heat source is applied and the rest of the keyhole is going to be almost cylindrical in shape and then there we can apply an empirical form uh, that depends upon the vaporization temperature and the ambient temperature of uh, the uh, material and uh, one can fit. Uh, these profiles that are going to give you the power uh, distribution in the keyhole and use a combination of uh, the Gaussian and the power distribution to achieve a heat source that looks like a nail head and uh, such a nail head heat source also seems to reproduce the keyhole shape quite accurately and uh, the number of uh, fitting parameters is not much uh, except for the empirical form. And uh, so, one could also use this in uh, the software to simulate the keyhole mode welding. So, here I am going to summarize now all the heat sources that I have discussed till now. So, on the first column we have the, the heat uh, profile uh, and then the second column we have got the number of parameters that have to be chosen and in the third comment, uh, column we have got the comments. So, the Gaussian profile is the simplest of all and it has only one parameter which is the radius and uh, there are uh, other profiles like such as the cylindrical heat source. Uh, 3D conical body heat source and Gaussian rod heat source which have two unknown parameters which are basically the radius and the depth of penetration of the heat source. The profile of the penetration of the heat source is already determined by the choice of the heat source whether it is cylindrical or conical etcetera only the depth needs to be identified and there are two unknown parameters for this heat source. And for the internal heat source the absorption coefficient becomes the uh, fitting parameter apart from the radius. And in the case of rotary Gaussian, we have got an additional fitting parameter there, the radius, the depth and the FS parameter that is to be uh, fit to calibrate the heat source. In the case of double ellipsoid, you have got a number of uh, unknown parameters that have to be identified. Uh, it can be 4 or more uh, depending upon the asymmetry of the heat source that we are choosing. And the nail head, uh, it is a bit difficult to tell how many parameters are unknown. Uh, the reason being that the empirically made uh, fit for the power uh, absorption as a function of the depth uh, will tell you how many parameters are involved. It can be uh, as small as 1 in case you choose a linear uh, profile and it can be more than that if you choose a complicated profile. However, radius also is one of the parameters that have to be identified. So, in this summary we can see that uh, we have the ability to go from a very simple heat source to a very complicated heat source. So, that the heat source is uh, matching the uh, experimentally known one as close as possible. And in the case of lasers, we have some more variety of uh, heat sources that are possible. The reason being that uh, unlike the plasma or arc welding setups, in the laser source the light can be then uh, made into uh, multiple beams and those beams can be then shaped by the lens actions. So, it is possible to have a variety of uh, heat source uh, distributions in laser that are not possible for example, in a arc source and therefore, I dedicate one or two slides on uh, how laser heat sources can be chosen. Very often the laser heat sources are uh, uh, known by a designation that is uh, going by TEM uh, transverse electromagnetic uh, wave uh, representation and we have got TEM 00, TEM 01 top hat etcetera or these kind of names are popular when we uh, read literature in the um, laser uh, uh, welding and laser cladding kind of a topic. The reason why the laser sources are very important is because they affect not only the heat uh, that is given to the body, they also affect for example, how the fluid flow is going to happen. So, the how the momentum of the liquid pool is going to be changed uh, through the buoyancy and Varangani convection also depends upon what kind of a heat source profile you have and the effect is via the temperature. And it also affects the mass flow because the uh, laser is going to melt the filler powder uh, in the path while the powder is reaching from the powder feeder into the base material. And uh, the kind of uh, heat source you have will tell you how much of powder is molten in the path and will get mixed with the liquid melt pool. Uh, 
So, therefore, it is going to affect the fluid flow as well as the mass transfer and therefore, one must identify the laser heat source description quite accurately. And there are direct measurements uh, that are possible for an experimental facility to know what kind of a heat source distribution you have for a given lens. And uh, these uh, equ equipment may not be available all the time. So, one must always look up the lenses that are used to know what kind of a uh, laser heat source is emerging out of that. The TEM modes are as follows. You have two ways of uh, describing the TEM modes. Uh, one is using the rectangular mode and other is using the cylindrical mode. That is, if there is an axisymmetry, you can use a cylindrical mode and if there is no axisymmetry, uh, then you can use a rectangular mode. And uh, uh, usually you have TEM and then there are two numbers that are uh, coming after it and the two numbers are basically uh, the number of uh, minima along the two different directions. And these can be also modeled analytically by using what are called Hermit polynomials, where m and n go as parameters, so that we have an analytical expression that is available, so that we can uh, produce the uh, heat source distribution that we have for any combination of m and n uh, in both rectangular and cylindrical. And the polynomials that are to be used for the cylindrical uh, heat source are basically Laguerre polynomials, and these uh, also uh, are available in the uh, open literature. TEM00 is the most common uh, uh, heat source description and that is basically the same as Gaussian. So, we have seen for the arc welding Gaussian is the most popular heat source description and uh, in the case of lasers it is a TEM00 which is the uh, mode that is used for uh, cutting and uh, for welding. TEM01 is popular in the case of uh, surfacing applications and that is a donut shaped distribution that is also quite popular. There are other modes that may not be popular for welding applications, but I will just show them to you just for the curiosity. So, here are how the modes are looking like. So, you can see that the way to interpret uh, these images is as follows, where you have a brighter white light that is where the intensity is high and where it is dark the intensity is low. So, you can see that the TEM00 means that the maximum intensity at the, the center and as you go away from the center the intensity is going to 0 and TEM01 for example, at the center you have got dark which means that it is a low intensity at the center, but as you go away there will be a toroidal space where you have got the intensity being high and then much much farther away again the intensity goes to 0. So, which means that you have got a donut shaped heat source that is available in TEM01 mode and there are other modes that are possible and you can see how these are looking like for different values of P and L. And how does a donut shaped heat source look like? I am just plotting it here to show you. And this is basically of interest because the maximum uh, uh, heat source is uh, not at the center of the heat source, uh, but is at a ring shaped uh, region that is away. So, which means that the peak temperatures achieved in the heat source uh, when the heat source is falling on the material is not going to be as high as in a Gaussian mode. And very often in a cladding application or surfacing application or uh, surface uh, modification application, we do not want to heat the material so that it actually melts. So, we have a situation where uh, the maximum uh, heat source uh, intensity has to be limited and a donut shaped uh, heat source can achieve that and this is how it looks like. And you can also see that you can combine a donut uh, shaped heat source distribution and a Gaussian uh, heat source distribution to see what is called a top hat uh, heat source distribution. Top hat means that there is a circular region where the intensity is almost flat and then out of the circle it is almost 0. So, it is like a very sharply changing the heat source and this is used for example, for surface applications. So, if you want to model for example, if the experimentator says that he has used or she has used the top hat heat source, then while modeling it. Uh, we do not need to construct new functions, we can just take two functions one for a top hat and another for Gaussian and then add them to proportionality to achieve this kind of a heat source. So, we have seen how to add the heat sources earlier for uh, leading heat source and uh, trailing heat sink, but they can also be merged at the same origin location to get different shapes. And the rectangular geometry the modes are shown here and you can see that uh, the downward shape is not there, but then uh, you can see that there are various lobes that are possible. And uh, these lobes are not uh, directly relevant for welding applications, but just for curiosity how do they look like I am showing it to you here. Okay. Apart from the spatial distribution uh, for laser electron beam uh, and for arc welding, it is also possible that you have a pulsing effect that is possible as a function of time. 
So, when you do not have any variation in the heat source that is coming from the weld uh, supply or uh, the uh, power supply, then uh, you have what is called as a constant power source which is uh, constant with time. But you may have also a possibility to go to what is called the pulsed heat source. So, what it implies is that uh, you may have the variation of the heat source from a low value to a high value uh, for two different amounts of time and the pulse frequency will tell you how many times we change as a function of time. So, you can see that I am indicating in the axis here for the intensity of the heat source uh, I B as in the base value and I P as in the peak value. So, we go from the base value to the peak value and again back to the base value after regular amount of time and then delta T P will tell you how much time is spent at the peak value and delta T B tells you how much time is spent at the base value. So, these two times uh, are required so that you can calculate what could be the frequency of this pulsing and the heat source uh, description should include this information because the way a pulsed heat source is going to affect the weld pool is going to be very different from a constant heat source. Particularly it affects the uh, convection that is happening inside the weld pool and then the solute distribution and then the microstructure. Therefore, uh, though the thermal processes may be approximated by an average value, but the fact that there was a pulsing should be captured and then used in the modeling effort. The way the uh, intensity is changed from the base to the peak value can also have an effect. In the case of lasers, it is very common to have what is called as a sawtooth kind of a uh, heat source uh, and you can see that uh, you can take uh, delta T 3 amount of time to go from the base value to the peak value and then again from the peak to the base you can take a different amount of time delta T 5. Okay. And so, these uh, details on uh, how much time is spent at the base value, how much time is spent to go to ramp up to the peak value and then again how much time is spent at the peak value and then how much time is spent to ramp down to the base value as a cyclic manner and then how many cycles we have in one second. So, this information should be known. So, in other words, if there is a known fact of pulsing in the weld heat source, then we must know what is the pulse frequency, what is the pulse shape and what is the uh, way that the pulse shape is then mixed and matched with different ones to arrive at the uh, total distribution as a function of time. And uh, the path that is taken by the heat source as it moves along is also important. In the case of most of the welds, the path is actually linear. So, which means that it is very simple and you can program it with just one variable velocity and with that we know the path. And uh, sometimes it is possible that the weld heat source may be taking a raster path, it may be going back and forth between two different positions. And this kind of a rastering is used for example, for surface applications, surfacing applications using laser or to do weld overlay etcetera. And the raster path will have as you can see a wavelength of the distance uh, and also the frequency at which it is changing from left to right etcetera. So, the raster path information must be known uh, to be able to capture the path of the uh, heat source accurately. It is also possible for example, in uh, a very fine beam that can be controlled by uh, lenses such as electron beam welding, an oscillatory path can also be taken. So, a, in the case of a, an electron beam, uh, you can actually uh, uh, deflect the electron beam uh, with a very uh, high precision and accuracy and you could actually achieve an oscillatory path. So, that you may have for example, a top hat kind of a heat source that is achieved effectively, but then with a very narrow beam that is being uh, made to go in an oscillatory path. And it also enhances the convection within the weld pool and mixes the weld pool and then avoids uh, micro segregation and other things. So, there are situations where you may want to actually capture that information. And uh, one can average all these paths to have an average value that can be used. However, the fact that there was a raster path, an oscillatory path with certain kind of a frequency and wavelength uh, should be known. So, that that information can be used to analyze effects that are caused by these kind of changes in the heat source. And these heat sources must be always benchmarked. So, we must know actually whether these heat sources have been calibrated and uh, we must know what information is being used for the calibration and what information is used for the validation. And we may not uh, do the same information for both because then there is no purpose in actually doing the modeling. So, typically for example, what is done is the fusion zone uh, shape is used for calibration and then the thermal profiles away from the fusion zone are used for validation and prediction. Uh, 
and uh, you must then not claim to have reproduced the fusion shape uh, because fusion zone shape itself was an input to calibrate. So, it is very important to delineate what parameters are used for calibration and what are used for the validation. And we must be able to validate to know that the heat source we have chosen is an accurate one and a reasonable one. And uh, closely matching the fusion zone uh, using a particular heat source function is also a confirmation that the heat source is reasonable. The uh, reason is as follows, you could not for example, match a keyhole shape uh, mode uh, profile using a Gaussian heat source, which means that it is not an appropriate heat source for keyhole mode welding. Okay? So, you may change the radius however, you may not match the shape. So, like that you must also look at the fact that you could match a shape for calibration itself is a vindication that that particular uh, heat source is actually reasonable. And when you do these fittings, you may also see that the peak temperatures are sometimes unrealistic and sometimes realistic. So, we must also keep an eye on what are the peak temperatures that are uh, calculated using modeling using these kind of heat sources, whether they are reasonable and whether the experimental evidences support such values have come out or not. And then when we make small changes in the parameters for the heat source, then how does the uh, weld uh, thermal profile change? So, that is also a trend that must be observed to know whether the heat source has been chosen correctly. And how many heat source parameters are there will also limit the uh, ability of uh, the scientist to change and then uh, verify. So, if you choose a double uh, ellipsoid uh, heat source model, then there are so many parameters that you may not be able to make a rigorous uh, systematic uh, change of all the parameters to know the sensitivity. But for example, for a Gaussian it is very uh, trivial to see whether the changes are uh, realistic or not and uh, to capture the trend being uh, correct or not. And what are the ways to validate the thermal profiles? There are uh, three different ways. The first and the simpler one is the thermocouple measurement and then the two color uh, IR parameter that is infrared parameters and then infrared thermography. So, these are the methods that are readily available uh, today to validate the thermal profiles. And the thermocouple measurement validation uh, is shown here using a welding setup that is in our lab in the materials joining laboratory uh, department of MME IIT Madras. And the facility shows you a GTAW welding setup uh, along with the data acquisition facility. And you could see that in the facility you have got a monitor where the weld uh, thermal profile is being recorded. And behind the monitor you see a box which is basically a signal conditioner uh, that uh, uh, enhances the accuracy with which we are measuring the thermocouple uh, signal. So, you know the thermocouple signal is going to be in millivolts and to be able to measure that uh, at a very high rate for example, in several hundred samples per second, then you need to ensure that uh, the signal conditioner is going to play a role there. And therefore, the design of the thermocouple uh, data acquisition setup uh, is important and that can be used with multiple thermocouples so that you can get the thermal profile measurements at given locations. So, it is important to note down where are the positions where the thermocouple is placed and then whether they are also not too closely spaced so that they may disturb the thermal field itself, but again they are not too far away placed so that they are also being useful for the thermal profile measurement. And the contact between the thermocouple and the sample must be always intact during the welding because if the contact is lost then you do have a signal loss. And then whether the electrical connections are uh, provided uh, properly because if the earthing or the neutral is not correct then you may have situation where the uh, measurement of the thermocouple uh, reading may be erroneous. And uh, you must also pay attention to the thickness of the thermocouple wires. Uh, the finer the wire the better it is for you because uh, uh, the signal is going to be uh, stabilized quite quickly for very very thin thermocouples. And the acquisition speed at which you are going to measure depends upon how thin the wires are. And usually for welding if you are able to acquire at 100 samples per second or more, then that would be adequate for you to capture the complete profile uh, by taking into account the various slope changes during the heating and the cooling cycles. Uh, thermography using IR cameras is an uh, expensive way of uh, doing uh, measurements, but it also provides a lot of information in just one single run. So, in this uh, schematic uh, plot, uh, we are actually showing you a snapshot from the IR thermography done on a, a friction surface deposit, uh, which is a weld overlay kind of a technique. And uh, the work is taken from the PhD thesis of uh, uh, Dr. Khalid Rafi from IIT Madras 2011. And uh, once you have a snapshot or a video, 
then you can actually look at the history of uh, the temperature of a particular location and then plot it as a function of distance or as a distance as a function of time. So, in other words, once you take one video, then you have a plethora of information that is available from the thermography and you could then use it to benchmark your thermal profiles that are calculated using the heat sources that you have modeled. So, it is important to choose the thermocouple and thermography so that it can be validated uh, against your thermal uh, uh, modeling uh, and uh, whether your heat source choice has been correct or not. So, we now summarize uh, the various methods of uh, calibrating and validating the thermal profiles that we have uh, uh, obtained by choosing the heat source distribution. So, the heat source distributions must be validated and we have looked at how thermocouples and uh, IR uh, visualization uh, setups can be used. In the case of thermocouple measurements, we must uh, take precaution that when we are uh, taking the data at high speed, then the thermal uh, thermocouple uh, wire thickness must be low, so that it can be acquiring the data at high speed uh, without uh, any loss of information. Multiple thermocouples are possible up to uh, 16 uh, very easily we can make. However, uh, each thermocouple requires you to drill a hole in the sample and each such hole will be uh, disturbing the thermal field around the fusion zone. So, which means that we must uh, uh, draw a line between uh, the accuracy of uh, the measurement and the number of points at which we want to measure by choosing an appropriate number of thermocouples for the measurement. In the case of uh, the uh, IR uh, pyrometer, because only one point can be uh, used for measurement using one pyrometer and each pyrometer is quite expensive, they are not very popular in uh, validating exercises. And uh, in the case of IR visualization uh, uh, videos that can be made, the frame rate is increasing with uh, technology advancing now. Uh, however, it is uh, still less than what thermocouples can be providing. And uh, one crucial information is that uh, the IR uh, thermography is only a surface information whereas, the thermocouple measurement can be giving you information from inside the sample at a depth from the surface. And the thermography can give you array of data which can be available in each time step which means that we can reconstruct the history of a uh, thermal profile of a location and also validate what would be comparable with the thermocouple. And we can also use microstructure as a marker to know whether these zones namely the fusion zone partially melted zone and heat affected zone are having bits that are uh, validated against the thermal profile that has been calculated uh, and the choice of uh, heat source is uh, accurate only uh, when these kind of zones are also reproduced accurately. And it is also important that when we are validating the thermal profiles with thermocouples or IR sensors, we must also uh, keep in mind that thermocouples and IR sensors also need calibration themselves against standard samples. And without calibration, the temperatures reported by these two experimental facilities could also be erroneous. Okay. So, before we wind up, I just uh, give you a couple of points to pay attention to. Uh, one important information is that when we choose the heat source distribution and then we want to use it to calculate temperature profile uh, at different locations on the surface of a weldment, then we must know that the integral of the thermal uh, profile distribution uh, that is when we sum up the amount of heat source that is dumped at each location in each square millimeter of area and then add it up in all the area of the surface, then we must get the same amount of heat that is being given by the heat source. So, we must not have a distribution which is not calibrated against this kind of an integral because then again we are making a mistake in the amount of heat source. And the number of locations where we want to estimate the heat source distribution uh, in a model that also must be high, uh, finer grid points must be uh, kept so that we can actually capture the entire variation of the heat source. If you have very small number of grid points, then the variation is not captured completely and that is evident from the uh, plot below. You can see that that plot above has a lot of grid points capturing the smooth variation of the heat source in a Gaussian and uh, the plot below actually is looking quite faceted, uh, the reason being that the number of grid points are very small. So, it, that is also one information that must be kept in mind because later on when we use this information to calculate thermal profiles, we may get erroneous information when the number of grid points within the weld zone are not adequate. And we also must ensure later on that uh, the time steps also must be small to do any calculation because uh, no uh, location on the surface should miss the phase change that will account for some of the heat. So, the heat source is important in the choice uh, to model the thermal profile and it also affects the results that you get out of them. So, adequate information uh, is available 
uh, in this lesson and we must then use this to choose the heat source distribution appropriately. So, I would then now summarize by saying that the heat source is to be modeled as close to the actual process as possible and there are may be a number of parameters. We must know their sensitivity to the intensity distribution. We must have a way to calibrate each of those parameters and then we must also ensure that the integral of the entire heat source distribution must be calibrated to equal unity. So, that we get as much of heat that is uh, dropped on the surface as that is drawn from the weld heat source and at the end we must only uh, expect to get out only as much as we put in. In other words, the simpler the heat source, the less variation in the output that we may expect. The more complicated the heat source, the more variety of results we may be able to match. With that, we close the lesson on heat sources and we will continue with thermal modeling from where we left off.